Last week, um, <laughs> we talked about a lot of demonic darkness, and it sounded extremely intimidating. It was like, whoa, you know, these locusts coming out of these pit and how they're described, and we surely could see people that, that, that probably the most in, encouraging thing that I took away from that text last week as I was studying is the, the one locust that are released in the second part of their chapter 9, um, where they have the, out of their mouths is the fire and out of their tails, um, they're like snakes with heads and they're biting, inflicting harm and how that's like, to me, uh, the way I understand that is just people are so deluded spiritually, they're talking out of both sides of their, their mouth. Like, it just didn't make sense. And that helps me understand the world I'm living in right now, is it feels that way when I try to listen to people and I'm like, you're not making any sense. And, and what we have to understand is there's a tremendous amount of spiritual delusion that causes that. I mean, it, it causes it on different levels. Sometimes it's extremely deep and it can go to really, really dark places. Sometimes it doesn't appear as, as dark to us as we look at it, but it really is dark. Because a person is like saying things and they don't even realize they're contradicting themselves. And so it's, uh, it's, it's helpful for us to understand some of those things. And so all of this stuff, man, was extremely intimidating as, we, as John receives this revelation and he's sort of prophesying out there about the future. He's also speaking to the people who are alive at that time. The church was going through a lot of difficult stuff. And, and he was basically saying, hey, man. Prior to the return of the Lord, things are going to get really, really dark. Um, and, and the Lord has given me this word so that you could be encouraged. You could know how you can navigate through that. And so we, we hear all this stuff about darkness, and darkness is a thing that, um, you know, we really don't talk about a lot. We talk more about um, the gray side of God, we don't, I think, I think it makes us feel a little bit unsophisticated to talk about a devil, you know, and we talk about demonic control, it just feels unsophisticated, what kind of church am I in, and you watch the news and you go, a sophisticated church, there's a lot of evil stuff going on in the world that you can't explain, uh, but you can see demonic forces and things are at the pick, but behind it, Christianity gives an explanation for why some of these things are happening. But yet in the midst of all of this darkness and confusion, it says, the Bible says that we are more than overcomers. You and I, if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are more than overcomers, even in the midst of all this darkness. And so when we get to chapter 10, we kind of have this interlude um, that helps us to take our, our a breath a little bit. Romans chapter 8 verse 37 says, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so as we face all of the evil that is in the world, regardless of whether it is, um, um, wh wh whether we have to like, tolerate and deal with it because of what's going on in, in the government or, or even what's going on at work or even what's going on you know, just in the environment that we're trying to raise kids and teach them about the truth of the gospel, um, we're more than overcomers. And so that begs the question, how does one go about overcoming evil? How do we overcome evil? And so uh, to help you with that today, if you don't mind, I'd like to tell you another red dog story. Is that okay? Do y'all like my red dog stories? Yeah. All right, good. good. My favorite four-legged friend, for sure, that I've ever had. Um, so... Red Dog, I, I had a sort of a, when I decided to get this dog, um, obviously a bloodhound is no, known for their tremendous sense of smell. Like a, they, can, they have a cold nose in the hound kingdom. They can smell the oldest trail. And so I kind of wanted to have one to, I thought it'd be fun to teach a dog how to recover wounded game. And um, especially in the deer hunting world in the state of Kansas, there's a lot of bow hunters, and there's a need for dogs like that, and sometimes as a hunter, you know, you need it yourself. You, you pray that you never do, but sometimes things don't go perfect in bow hunting, and so it's, it's good to have that, and so I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to get me one. I've had one before. Somebody stole him. I wanted another one, so I got me one last year, and I worked with this pup um, through the summer, was laying down blood trails and teaching him how to do this, and 
And he was doing it. It was a lot of fun. And uh, so this hunting season, oh, by the way, tomorrow's Red's birthday, <laughs> okay? Uh, and, so, uh, he, and so this season was going to be kind of his, his practice, like, He's got to figure out this is not like me laying a trail. There are going to be actual things that we're going to try to do. And so the plan and hope was let's get this dog on some really easy trails so that he can build his confidence up and I can figure out what he's doing and I know how to uh, read him and understand him. And so lo and behold, Thursday night I get a text and Shay said, BBD, which means big buck down, Okay. And Gabriel has, has got him a big deer down. And I said, well, I said was, it, was it a good shot? Oh, yeah, man, just center punch this deer. He's, he's down, going to be a great blood trail. I said, all right, I'm having Jonah bring red. I'll meet you over there. And so we meet over there. It's dark. And we per- commence to looking for this deer. And we do find um, the trail. But, it, man, it's, as we get into it, the dog's kind of getting on it and off of it. I, don't, I can't tell what he's doing. He takes us through the timber. We are finding some blood here and there. We, he does lead us straight to um, the arrow, and so we're, we're feeling pretty good. And, man, then it just starts to dry up on us. The dog keeps going in these different ways, and I can't tell, man, is Red Dog following this deer that has been wounded, or is he following every deer that lives out here on this place? And so I'm like, and he, at one point he takes me up, uh, like through a, a, takes me up a hill that is thick, and I did not know you could go through brush so fast, okay? But he just towed me up it, and he was kind of off, and we, we, we finally, like he actually wasn't way far off. We we thought he was, we just wasn't sure, and we end up, um, we end up jumping the deer. He 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 had not um, expired yet. And so we had to back out. And I'm thinking, like, man, this is a liver shot. And so a liver shot, they, they don't bleed a whole lot. Um, it's a fatal wound. And so Shay has a showing next, the next morning. And this, this story is really about the church because everybody that was there, Micah was there, uh, my boys were there, um, uh, Cody and Landon. I mean, we had half the church there. <laughs> and so... Uh, so Shay has a showing, so me and Cody and Gabriel go the next morning, and we start where we saw this, this, this deer the last time. And Red gets on it, man, and, and he immediately puts his nose down, and he starts taking me up through the timber again. And, I mean, it's fast, and usually I go slow when I'm doing this, so I'm having to try to look as we're going, and I'm being pulled. And, and I look down, and I see a, a, I'm actually, actually able to identify a drop of, of blood and then we get up to the top of where it kind of comes into an opening in a cedar thicket, nothing. And the dog turns left, and he goes down about 75, 80 yards, and he turns right, and he goes up another 100 yards, and he starts sniffing around in this corner. And I'm like looking around, I'm like, what are you doing, man? <laughs> and then we end up going up the hill. And so I'm like, well, I... <sighs> I don't know what to do. I'm learning to. I have no idea other than things I've read. So I take him back to where we found the last sign of the deer. And we do it. And he takes me left about 80 yards. He takes me right another 80 yards. He gets up in this corner. He sniffs around. And then we, I'm like, ah, oh, there's a, this is ridiculous. I got things to do. And we, can't, we still can't find blood. And then um, I do this again a third time. He does the same thing, but this time he takes me across the fence. He gets me in stuff that's this thick, this Lespedeza stuff, and it's uh, like it's chewing me up. I turn around and try to find Gabriel. All I can see is an orange head coming through there. <laughs> and the dog is just going, he's going in circles, and he won't leave this area. And I'm like, there's no way this deer is in here because there's too much that I would have been able to see where he would be. And so we, I pull him out of there, and I... Go back around, and I tell Cody, I said, listen, man, I, we need to find and make sure from the last point where we saw this deer, where we know he was at, did he go right or did he go left? And so we, we looked and we looked, and we finally found a little bitty pin drop, pin drop size. We found two of them, and he turned left. He turned the direction Red was going. And so Cody says, well, um, we're, we can, we, we were getting frustrated, and he says, 
let him go again. And, and so I let him go again. And lo and behold, he does the same thing. Goes left, turns right, gets up by a corner, starts sniffing around. Then he comes off the corner. And he swings over in a catacorner corner from where we came. And he's sniffing around there. And then he, boom, he does a 180. He puts his head down. And I look down and there's blood. And, and then he moves back to the corner. He goes across like this. Cody says, hey, a deer just ran over there. And then there's like a little hill about this high that is right on the other side of this corner that he keeps taking me. The dog goes up it. He comes down it. So I follow him. Boom. And lo and behold. Red Dog made his first recovery. Come on. Look at that. All right. What in the world does this have to do with Revelation chapter 10? The dog laid a hold of something, and he wouldn't let go. And I kept kind of, like, I kept coming off of it. I didn't have confidence, but he stayed in it. He stayed in it. And he was largely responsible for us finding um, Gabriel's deer and it was just a fantastic day for all of us and I'm convinced that we would not have found him as soon as we did and maybe not even have found him because we would have overlooked um, this area so it was a really cool thing and when we get to Revelation chapter 10 we're going to see some things that I believe and here's what I'm going to do I'm going to read it I'm going to explain it to you some of the symbology in it what it's about and then I'm going to give you what I think is the most important thing I've learned as a follower of Jesus The most important, like, if you look over and and you're a part of this church, the most important thing that I could teach you today, um, I would want you to learn this. Because if you learn this, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay no matter what kind of darkness comes against you, how evil the world gets. You will be okay if you will get this that I'm going to teach you today and what I see here in Revelation chapter 10. And as a body of believers, if we will all... Um, like the lights will come on for us and we will walk this out, we will see incredible things happen within the context of uh, our, our spiritual family at OPCC. So let's read it, jump into Revelation chapter 10 uh, and, and see what the Lord has for us today. It says, uh, then I saw, and this is after all these pictures of evil, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. And he was robed in a cloud, With a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. And he was holding a little scroll, which lay open in his hand. And he planted his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, There will be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. And it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So what is going on here is, again, a picture. After the Lord gives us this picture, and, and, and we see this in a lot of the apocalyptic literature, whether we're looking at it in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we see a, 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 like a strong sort of terrifying, really, picture of evil. And then there's an interlude. 
And it has this rhythm, and all of a sudden it opens up, and it says, but don't forget, guys, who you belong to. And it sort of gives us this pause, and we're comforted by it in the midst of trying to understand some stuff that really is, is terrifying, for a lack of better terms. Some of the things that we've read in the book of Revelation, they're frightening, they're unnerving. And so the Lord is being honest with us. He's saying, look, this is, this is where things are headed. This is how this is going to play out. But then he stops every once in a while. He says, be encouraged, man. I got this. That's what he's saying in chapter 10. And so there, there are different opinions about who this angel of the Lord is in chapter 10. And some uh, theologians believe that it is actually an angel of the Lord, an angel. And the word angel means angelos, it's a messenger, okay, so it could be used in different contexts. And so some, some theologians believe it's actually an angel of the Lord who represents the attributes of Jesus. There are others who believe it is actually Jesus, okay? We don't know for sure. But when I do this interpretation and explain this text to you, it doesn't really matter because even if it was an angel, he would be representing Jesus and all the attributes of Jesus. I tend to kind of believe um, and fall in line and say, man, this sounds like the Lord to me. It sounds like the Lord. It's a picture of the Lord and there are reasons. And say, well, why would somebody not think it's the Lord? And really one of the big things about it, I think that that causes people to say it's not the Lord is because it says that he... Um, what does it say? He swears, um, he swears to the one who made the heavens and the earth. And so it's like, how could, like an angel would have to swear to God, but in the triune Godhood, he could just, to me, in my mind, he could be swearing to himself. Okay. And so we look at this and, and I, I see a picture of the Lord, regardless if it is, is, it is actually the Lord or the angel who is described or is, is, is portraying the attributes of the Lord. Um, it really is about Jesus. Okay. And the reason I think it's the Lord is because he's always, in the Bible, Jesus um, or God in the Old Testament is always depicted as riding on clouds. Like he's, he's coming in the clouds. We write songs about that because the language of the Bible always depicts us or depicts for us as we try to understand the Lord and his coming is there are always clouds. When he ascended, the last time he ascended, he ascended up into the clouds. And so we have this language uh, that's always describing God. If you read the Psalms, you'll, you'll see that his chariot is the clouds. He rides on the clouds. And so I see this as um, he's being p- depicted as coming on the clouds. And then it has this idea of a, ra- a rainbow. What's that about? Well, the rainbow is symbolic of the covenant that God made. We know it goes back to... Um, uh, Noah, and we also know that when we studied about the throne room a few weeks ago, that there was a rainbow emanating from the throne of God. And so I see that and I understand that as that these are the covenants of God. That when God makes a covenant, He's always wanting us to be reminded that He is true to the covenants that He makes. So if you know Him, like He's He's this rainbow is to remind us, man, He is true to Himself, and we need not fear anything. If we are His, we belong to Him, and nothing um, can change that. And then it says His face is like the sun. And that reminds me that anyone who um, turns toward him, their countenance is changed because his face is always like, it's just blazing. And so as we would turn toward the sun with our body and our countenance is literally changed um, by the tone of our skin, spiritually as we turn toward the Lord, our countenance is changed because the inner man is being heated up and he's learning to walk in white hot faith and his countenance begins to look different because he's walking in the spirit and in the freedom of the Lord. It says that um, his legs are like fiery pillars, which tells us that he is immovable and unstoppable and it's futile to fight against him. Like it's futile, it's futile to live a life to where we would try to fight against the things of the Lord. Yet we see that this is what evil uses all the time is to try to sway us and get us into a position where we get our, our mind off of the things of the Lord. As so powerful is the evil that we face that even the apostle Peter, in one moment he is so focused and turned toward the Lord, his countenance is revealing the Father and Jesus says to him, flesh and blood did not reveal 
reveal this to you, Peter, that you proclaim me as Christ, and the Father in heaven is the one who showed that to you. And then Jesus says he's about to suffer, and Peter says, I'll not have it. And he says, get behind me, Satan. And so this powerful force, even the apostle Peter like, was, um, uh, was influenced by it. And, and so that tells us that we are not immune from it, but we need to know that as we look at the Lord and we, we, we belong to him, that even though this force is influential in our lives and it can distract us, that's why it is necessary to turn toward him and let his truth burn in our hearts and keep us receptive to what he's saying so that we can walk out in obedience on a daily basis, his desire for our lives, and we can see the kingdom move in and around and through us. And so it, what, what's fascinating is that People will often, often try to fight against God, but we see this picture, man. You can't fight against someone who has legs that are depicted as, as fiery. And, and like, how do you even approach that and try to move it out of your life? You can't. And that's the point that I think is being made in this picture. It's futile to fight against him. And he's holding a little scroll. And I believe this little scroll is, is, is his word. It is the word preserved for us, and it's described as being opened in his hand. And so here is this being that is described this way, and his right foot is planted on, uh, one of his feet is planted on the land, and the other is on the sea. And what that tells us, men, is that he is in sovereign control of all creation, even when it, does, even when it feels like he's not. He's in control. And, and so he, he, he gives a picture of him standing on the planet that every living being either touches land um, or water, and obviously it would include the, the sky as well. And so here he is in sovereign control of all creation, and he has the voice of a lion. He's had the voice of the lamb in the, all the gospels when he comes as a suffering servant. We learned um, last uh, a spring, I believe it was, I don't remember when it was, we talked about the lion uh, um, and out of Amos, how he is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and he comes in the New Testament when we see him in the gospels, he's the suffering servant, the lamb of God who is slain, who takes away the sin of the world. But when we see him in Revelation, he's described as a lion, man, and he speaks speaks and he roars like a lion. His voice sounds that way. And then all of a sudden in his um, spoken word, there are seven thunders. And I believe that they echo the power and truth of his voice. And we say, well, what did they say? Well, I don't know. <laughs> because John said, I was about to write it down. And the Lord said, no. The voice from heaven said, seal it up. The same thing happened for Daniel. Daniel was not able to write about the things that God showed him, all of the things. The Apostle Paul he describes in uh, the book of Corinthians how he was caught up to the third heaven. And he says, it was not permissible for me to share what I saw. The Lord wouldn't let him do it. But, but here's something John was made known and aware of that we um, don't know anything about. And so we don't know what we don't know. And so we shouldn't try to speculate on what it is. But we should take this away from it. Some things the Lord intentionally withholds from us. And we have to be okay with that as believers. Sometimes God doesn't make sense. Sometimes people who seem bright and are headed for a great ministry career and missions or something, they die in plane crashes, and they're young in the Lord, and they're committed to the Lord, and we look at that and we go, why? How? And we can't get those answers, but we can ask, what am I to learn from this, Lord? What am I to take away? And so there will be things in your life that happen. There will be things relationally that happen to pe with people that your hopes are let down, your heart gets broken, and you will wonder, um, why is this happening? And you should never wonder why this is happening, and you should never question, like, unless you're trying to learn maybe what you did to cause it, but in, in a lot of times, there's just no explanation. It just is what it is, and information is withheld from us, and the question should always be, Lord, what do I learn from this? What are you trying to teach me? What can I take away from this situation? And the Lord will teach you, and he will work in that, but we have to be, we have to be comfortable as followers of Jesus. We have to be comfortable with the sovereignty of God and knowing that we won't know all things um, until he returns. But in this moment, we see that he raises his right hand. And again, I see he swears by himself and his covenant is with his own. 
And so this promise goes out and it goes forth to all of his creation and it goes out to all of his chosen people whom he's chosen to reveal himself to and have responded to that that, uh, choosing of his and they've come to know the Lord and he swears by himself that all are his, okay? And so in the midst of all of this darkness that is terrifying and is being described, and we can get a little nervous, and if you're trying to talk your kids through it, and they're like, man, that like makes me a little nervous, you got to show them this picture. And see, if you're his, man, you're his. And he will never let anything happen to you. You are always going to be in his hand. And something may happen to you physically, but nothing can happen to you spiritually. And you're good for all eternity. Because he swears by himself to take care of you. And so the promise that he gives is there will be no more delay. And it says that in that we see either two pictures. One, there will be no more delay before the seventh trumpet is actually sounded. Or at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, time is no more. The word chronos is the word used there for time. And it says there will be no more uh, in it. And so it could be and there's no more delay for when it happens. Or this is actually when time has shifted and we are getting ready to speedily enter into eternity. And the mystery, it says, that the prophets announced is made known to all. Now, what in the world is that about? Well, when we went through the minor prophets before this series, I believe that, that the mystery of God is, is in, the, in the prophets of God. So as we read through the minor prophets and, and some of even the major prophets, and we look at the Old Testament, we'll see that the apostles spent all their time studying that stuff. And we live in a world right now, culturally, where everybody says the Old Testament is irrelevant. The Old Testament was their word as the New Testament was being written. And the, New, the Old Testament helped them through the power of the Spirit and illumination to unlock the mysteries that were revealed to the minor prophets and the major prophets in the Old Testament. They were able to put together that Jesus, in fact, was the Messiah. Now, obviously, they, they experienced the resurrected Lord, and he revealed things to them. And they served in a prophetic role as well. But it shows us the importance and the significance in our day and age of the Old Testament. It sheds light on the New Testament. And the mystery, the mystery of God comes from the Greek word mysterion. And it means that which was hidden has been made known. And so we go right here in this particular passage of scripture. The mystery is made known to all. The mystery has already been made known to us. As believers, the mystery has been revealed to the uh, apostles and the prophets and the people of God. Now, maybe we don't understand all of it, but we get a picture of it. But in this moment, when this no more delay happens, the entire world will see the mystery unlocked. And they will see like that this is like Jesus is for real. All roads don't actually lead to God. Jesus is the only one that does. That's the mystery. And the mystery of how he does it is he becomes a man himself and he dies in our stead. And so this is the picture that the Lord is painting for us out of Revelation chapter 10. And so how do we take that and use it and go, well, what does this mean for me in my my life right now if, if, like, how do I use this? Well, it's usable, okay? It was usable to the first century Christians that were going through terrible, evil, and dark times and were being persecuted in terrible ways by the uh, Roman government. Um, it was usable for them, and it is usable for us today because whatever darkness that we're living in, and there has always been darkness present that all believers live in, and whatever oppression, whatever persecution, whatever affliction, whatever suffering that we go through, we're able to draw from the teachings of Revelation chapter 10 and know this is how I am a conqueror of that. This is how I overcome in that situation. How can I be an overcomer? And here's the first one you got to take a hold of the word. That's the first thing he says. He says, then the voice that I heard, and we're starting here in verse 8. The voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go take the scroll. Okay? So the word here, take, is the Greek word lumbano. And it means to take a hold of, to carry away, to make one's own, to reach after, to not refuse or reject. 
So the word of God, you have to look at and go, I'm not refusing that. I don't care what it says. I don't care how hard it is for me to um, get my mind wrapped around it. The first place I've got to do is I've got to take a hold of it. I cannot be rejecting the word of God. And we're living in a day and age where even many in the church, and the church is described as in the end times, it will become apostate. We are living in a day where many of the people and leaders in the church will not take a hold of the word of God. They are rejecting parts of it. And we see here that John is being told, go take, that, take a hold of that word that is in his hand. And so we have to um, understand that if we're going to walk in freedom, you see, we love, man, I love, to, don't you all love to talk about the blessings of the Bible? Man, the Lord loves me. He's so good to me. He did this for me. He did that for me. He did this for that. And we just love talking about that. If you want to walk in that life, you better take a hold of the word. You don't just get that just because you know that maybe it's out there and because uh, Pastor Shea believes it. You don't get to walk in the freedom of the Lord because Pastor Shea is walking in the freedom of the Lord or because Mama Coop is walking in the freedom of the Lord. The only way to walk in the freedom of the Lord is you got to look at the word yourself and go, I need to take a hold of that. I need to, I need to understand that the word is from God and it, he has it in his hand, and it's mine for the taking if I desire to take it. And this trips a lot of people up. Like I, uh, I've been trying to uh, lead a, a person to the Lord recently, and this is tripping them up. They just can't take a hold of the word, man. They just, they just can't get there. And at some point, you got to be able to take a hold of it and go, this is it, right? Like I, I remember when I was uh, younger, and I always believed the word. And my mom raised me in, a, in, in church, and so I sort of became a follower of Jesus at nine. Man, I didn't take a hold of the word until I was 22. <laughs> and I took a hold of it, and I was like, man, there it is right there. I believe that the word is, in fact, what it says it is. Here's the second thing. This is so important. You've got to ask the Lord for understanding of the word. The second thing he says, after he's told to go take it, he says, so I went to the angel, and I asked him to give it to me. So one, I'm taking it for truth, and two, I'm asking him to help me understand the truth that he has given me. This never stops, okay? I, I have been a, a student of the Word of God, like, like, I mean, committed to, like, reading the Word and studying it, not to teach it. And obviously, I'm doing that, too. But before I ever teach something, man, I want to own it. Like, I want to know it. And, and so here I am 30 years later, and it's the first time I could ever exegete this text. Because I kept asking the Lord to give me understanding. And finally, the Lord gave me an understanding that I was confident enough that I could bring to a group of people and teach them and say, this is what I believe the Lord is saying to us. And, and so, like, what, what I, what, the reason I share that experience is, is you need to know, man, that most things in the Word that are going to bring freedom in your life, I can't teach you. I can proclaim it to you, but the Holy Spirit has to teach you. And when He teaches you, something shifts inside of you. There is a freedom that happens that is unlike being motivated from a talk that a pastor gives to you on a weekly basis because you see it and you're like, whoa, like, what is this? And then you're flipping around. You're like, I read something the other day and then you're, and you're flipping around. And then instead of going, I need to read the word tomorrow, you're going, geez, I got to get to work. I don't have enough time to read more of this. It's just a flip, man. A switch comes on. And, and that's what happens, but you got to ask the Lord, Lord, help me understand what it is that I am taking from you. It comes from the Greek word didomai, this, this when he says ask. And it's give to one asking, let have or extend. So here it is, man. Like, so, so we have, I think we have people that go, yeah, I believe the Bible, man. And they have absolutely no idea what it says. Right? And then we have people go, oh, man, the Bible, I'm taking it for what it is, and then I'm going to ask the Lord to help me understand what I'm reading. 
And don't feel like you have to all, all of a sudden um, be able to explain everything about the Bible. You are not reading so that you can explain to all your friends what the Bible teaches and how jacked up they are in their thinking. You are reading so that you understand what you believe in the world that is all jacked up in your thinking, and the truth of God can correct you. And then it will come out in your life, and people will see it, and they will want to know what is going on in you, like what is happening? Why is there a shift taking place? And you could simply tell them, man, I've been in the Word. I took a hold of it. I asked the Lord to understand this passage, and this is what He helped me to see. And I started, I started walking in obedience in that thing, and all of a sudden, man, I had joy that I didn't even know existed in the world. That's the way it works. And so then, how does it get to that point? Well, this is where it becomes crucial. You must eat the Word. This comes from the word katastio, and it means devour and consume by eating. And so as I get the understanding, I'm not done yet. Now I understand, my mind understands it, now I have to consume it. So how do we consume the word? How do we eat the word? Uh, obviously, we, in discipleship, we teach you a tool. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the actual process of I'm consuming it. Uh, I'm reminded of Jesus saying, it's not what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. It's what goes into your mouth. I, I think maybe Jesus here was talking about, uh, no, he said it the other way. He said, it's not what goes in that consumes you, but what comes out. And so he's just trying to give us a picture of how do we get the right stuff to come out? Well, we have to consume it with a spiritual mouth. And I think that the way we consume something is that we first have understanding of it. And the Lord says, okay, um, like Shay, this is what this means. And Shay is like looking at it and he, I, I like having you on the front row. I think Brian does too, because I don't pick on Brian when you're here. He says, so Shay is reading it, and he's going, I, I understand it. He has not eaten the word yet. He has not eaten the word until he takes what he understands and does what it's calling him to do. When he does it, he has now digested the truth that he clearly understands. He's walked out the conviction that he's experiencing. And whether it is a sin that he needs to avoid or a work that the Lord is asking him to do in obedience, he can walk it out. And when he walks it out, he has now taken what looks good, what smells good, what he clearly understands what it is, and he has consumed it, and it has impacted his life. And his body starts to react to what is happening in his spirit as he has eaten the word of God, and the truth starts shaping who Shea is. You know what? I, I know Shea really well. <laughs> this is a fun sermon. Uh, I know Shea really well. If Shay didn't love Jesus, I don't think I would like him. I just don't think I would. I don't think he would like me. As a matter of fact, I know you guys would not like me. And so why, did, why is it that we would like Shay? The, the best part, like Shay is a fun dude, okay? He's got all these things going on. But the best thing about Shay is his love for the Lord, okay? We can see that in him. And so as we see that in each other, he's devouring the word, he's consuming it, and so he's walking out in obedience, and that's attractional to us. And it's easy for Shay to do the next thing, because he eats the word, he shares the word. That's what John is told to do, go proclaim it, okay? Which is the number one thing, by the way, in the church that most um, lay people, um, that, which means that you're not paid at the church. The number one thing that people are scared of is sharing the word. I don't know how to share the word. The reason you don't know how to share the word is because you, don't, you haven't taken the word. Or you, maybe you've taken the word, but you don't understand it yet. And you certainly haven't um, gotten a hold of it to the point where you've devoured it. it because we, when you devour the word, when you get an understanding of something, and then you eat it, you can't hardly wait to tell somebody about it. Um, Brad, yesterday, he took me to, what is, what is the name of that restaurant? The one down in Paola. Oh, El Potro. El Potro. Here's a shout out to El Potro in Paola, uh, Kansas. Best, best Mexican food in Kansas, all right? Which is saying a lot. Like, I mean, I, 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 this place is amazing. And why am I telling you that? Because I ate it. 
And their cheese enchiladas are fire, man. And if you like cheese enchiladas, you got to have some of those things. The same thing happens in the word, man. I eat the word. I understand the word. It hits me, and I'm like, I got, you can ask my kids, man. When I come out after a sermon, <laughs> I say, you got to hear this. And I kind of work through a lot. A lot of times I'll come up, and I'll tell Abby, this is what the Lord showed me. It, it's not so much that I'm wanting them to suffer through the sermon twice. It's, I got to get it out, man. It's in there, and I, I just need to release. Sometimes I'll, I'll call somebody and say, man, you're never, never going to believe what the Lord showed me. And that's the, that's the process. Man, that's how you overcome evil. Is you get the word in you, you eat it, man, and then you, it just it starts coming out of you. You don't have to have, be afraid. I mean, the worst thing you could do is be like, I'm terrified right now. I'm going to go up, and I, I feel the Lord's telling me I got to go uh, and tell them, my neighbor about the gospel. I man, if you're feeling that way, don't tell them you go to this church, <laughs> right? The, the people in the New Testament were eager and they were just coming out of them. And then people were coming around them. And it was just happening. And that's what we want our church to be marked by is that we're all, we're all just so on fire for what's happening to our, 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 our being as it's being shaped in the image of the Lord as we're consuming the word and we're devouring it and eating it on a consistent basis. And we start sharing the freedom that we're experiencing. And then it's just fun. It's not hard. It's a part of our DNA. It's a part of who we are. And it begins to just happen in our lives. And here, here is the big idea as we land this thing today. It is bittersweet to become an overcomer. And when you eat it, John, it'll be sweet like honey in your mouth. But when you get it down inside, it's going to be bitter. It's going to feel a little sour. What in the world is that about? It's about when you understand something and the Lord has shown you and you try to share it with somebody else and they reject it. It's bitter. It's bitter for you. Um, because you, you, you just, like you want them to know what you know and they don't know what you know. Friday afternoon, when we were looking for blood droplets to identify that we should turn left, Red was laying on his belly tied up to a tree watching us. Red knew something we didn't know. And he kept trying to show us. And we kept working. And we kept trying. Red had laid a hold of something that was true. And he kept going back and he kept going back. And it was sweet for him because he knew he was close. But it was also bitter because his owner wasn't trusting him and so like when we, that's that's a, such a great picture of life is that man we'll be walking in this sweetness and sometimes it will be bitter because people will say no to jesus people say i don't really have time for that and they won't be as excited about what's coming out of us so sometimes people will even distance themselves from us because not because they don't like us it's just because they don't understand what we're understanding and it just starts to like it just starts to create space. And so once you take a hold of the word and you make it your own, you lay hold of it and you go, man, I, I'm going to start consuming it and I'm going to start walking it out. You're going to start walking in freedom. And there's going to be a white hot faith that comes out of you that honestly you won't be able to explain because it is not from this world. It is from the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord for you today. The most important thing you could ever learn. And you say, well, wouldn't it be that Jesus, Jesus will save me? Isn't that the important, most important thing? Well, you learn that by consuming the word. That's why this, this is so important is that, that if, if, if things got so bad and so oppressive that they said, we got to go into hiding and we can't have church. And you say, well, that, 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 that's probably not going to happen in our lifetimes. But there are people living on the planet right now, it's happening in their lifetimes. Like right now, there are people who would love to be doing what we're doing. And if they know how to eat the word and they have, a, they have the word there available to them and they can consume it, they're going to be just fine. They're going to just continue to stay encouraged and the spirit is going to do his work. And so that's, man, that's, that's the hope. Is, it's not that we just have a bunch of people that come to our church and we go, oh, look at us, man. We're running multiple services and we're doing all this cool stuff. Who cares, man, if the people aren't eating the word? 
Like, what, what difference does it make? What difference does it make if we have tons of people that come to our church and nobody's actually in the word listening to the voice of the Lord and walking out obedience and changing the world around them? What difference does that make? That man, when we are in that place and we stay committed to that and we are walking that out, the Lord will do something special. He'll do something special. We don't want to miss that. And so I want to encourage you today to know that he who has his foot planted on the sea and on the land has his eyes on you. He has the book open in his hand, and he's waiting for you to take it. Take hold of it. Don't let it go. Ask him for understanding, and let him teach you how to eat it and become the person that he wants you to be. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the word that teaches us how to follow you teaches us about our obedience. It teaches us about your, the joy that comes from you, Holy Spirit. It teaches us um, about ourselves. It teaches us how to live life to the fullest. And we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, as a ministry, as a body of believers, in this room today, those watching online, like we pray, Lord, that you would always help us to be true to what your desire is for the church. And we know, Lord, that if we get away from the word, we're going to break things all the time. But if we will keep just plugging away and digging into it, you will take us on a journey and you will do the work of the Spirit through us. We thank you for this day. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the remainder of the week. And we ask these things in Christ's name. And amen. Before we begin in the spirit of worship, I do want to encourage you, man. If you got questions, you like want to talk about this some more. Maybe the Lord is like, and take like you don't even know what the next step is, and you need help in understanding that. Again, you can go to the Word, but you also have pastors and and disciple makers in this room. People, man, we'd love to help you with that. So don't hesitate to put a connection card in the plate on your way out or hand it to me email one of us all of our names are in email addresses are in the back of the board bulletin and say hey uh want to meet this week and and we'll we'll have some fun together sean lead us